This video is going to be a film study look at the impact that Jadavion Clowney and Kyle Van Noy have had over, over the course of the season, but more so in recent weeks. Uh, they've been a revelation. I don't know that any of us. Uh, I know that me personally, I was, I was more positive about the Van Noy signing than Clowney. Just because the film from last year, the most recent film, uh, in the case of Van Noy, showed a guy who had tremendous impact. He had five sacks, a number of impact plays in his final five regular season games with the Chargers in 2022. Clowney suffered through an injury-riddled uh, 2022 campaign, so that the corresponding film that was that high level just did not exist. Uh, nonetheless, this year, Clowney, eight and a half sacks, tremendous amount of force, uh, commitment. He's tenacious. He's a downhill guy. Add some versatility as well that I think I'll show in at least a couple of plays in this video. And then Van Noy. I think Van Noy has now a career high in sacks at, at eight at age 32 on his third team in the last, really his fourth team in the last four years because he went back to New England um, after leaving Miami, ended up with the Chargers last year, only five sacks playing in all 17 games and now has eight sacks in only 13 games with the Ravens. He came pre-installed with the versatility. Uh, we knew that it was there, ability to drop out in pass coverage, slip, slide to inside linebacker like you saw on Roquan Smith's interception last week. I'll try to show you that one in this video as well. They've been a consistent presence, and I don't mean availability each game. I mean on every snap. When they're on the field, particularly together, but either one of them teamed up with Odafe Owe on the other side, They've had an impact. No matter what they're asked to do, they can both play on the right and left side, play well against the run or the pass. There's, there's no identifiable weaknesses uh, that I see. I, I almost see them somewhat interchangeable from a strong side and weak side standpoint. And in fact, I think a lot of the times when people call one of them the, the Sam or, or Jack or whatever, I think we're wrong. I think sometimes it's field and boundary, and sometimes those calls are switched depending on what Mike McDonald's coverage is. Additionally, they both have that knack for timely plays, clutch gene, whatever you want to call it. They both have it. I feel like Clowney is a guy who, whose impact is felt more so as the game progresses. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's in the fourth quarter when we're already in a lead or, or he's playing downhill. We've, we've forced people to be one-dimensional. But Clowney's impact, not saying he doesn't make plays in the first quarter, but he seems to grow in size and in, in impact over the course of a 60-minute game. Oh, look, Owe is also playing well. He's got five sacks. Those three seem to be playing between 35 and 40 snaps per game. As an aside, one thing I have noticed looking at some of the stats uh, Tuesday night is um, oh, we're 11-1 and one when Owe plays, with the only loss being our loss at home to the Browns, our, our last regular season loss. Back to Clowney and Van Noy. In terms of the cost, clearly – we're making out like bandits from a front office standpoint. To re-sign one or both of them for next year, the cost should go up, right? You would you would expect that those guys would want more based on their production. I do wonder, A, how much of a market there's going to be out there for them. In the case of Clowney, I think the market will be larger. And that's a little bit backwards, if you ask me. Because in terms of the guy who I think can play more a widespread number of techniques or assignments, it's Van Noy for me. And I really like both of these guys. But even the film from last year with the Chargers, I found myself saying, why didn't he play more? And then in the last five games of the regular season, when the Ravens did sign him or when they were looking at signing him, excuse me, in training camp, I did a film study video on Clowney and I thought, why didn't he play more? And then the last five weeks of 2022, he did and he had five sacks and, and played, I thought, extremely well. But one point I want to make before we get to the film is imagine their sack numbers were cut in half. So let's say they each only had four sacks. So a total of eight or eight and a half sacks between the two of them. But everything else was the same. Their ability against the run, their versatility, their QB hits or QB pressures, if you will, passes deflected, which I'll show you at least four of them in this film, two from each of these guys. I still think that it'd be worth resigning them. Maybe um, my eyes are too, too bright in terms of the impact that they're having. But I think when you look at where we were with the injuries early on to Owe, Ojabo's um, unpredictability, how was he going to come back? We saw him in training camp and in the preseason, and then he suffered another injury. These two guys have really saved that position. Even if Owe weren't around, these guys got it covered. 
And at this point, I think I said this in the video last week, if it's a game-winning play or a game-winning series down near the goal line, these are the two guys I want in the game. And, and that's no slight or, or shade directed at Odafe Owe. It's just an indication of how well these guys are playing. We're going to start the film with Clowney first because I think it's the, perhaps the most interesting uh, element here because he's moved around so much, former number one pick with a huge reputation. The thing that I like about him is he's completely committed to his angle. Uh, there's some times where I think he plays a little upright and maybe the hand placement on certain things is is slightly off, but Jadavion Clowney plays downhill. And I've said that phrase or that word, you know, probably three dozen times at this point in the 2023 season. I think it's because our guys tend to play downhill. So many of them are so committed to their angle, committed to what their responsibility is. I forget who it was uh, last week on Twitter. Maybe, uh, maybe Will Blackman, I'm not sure. Someone who I follow on Twitter was talking about how sold out uh, these Ravens are for each other. And I think you see very clear evidence of it in all of our players, in all of our positions. But Jadavion Clowney, to me, is is the biggest illustration of it. Look, early in the season, we forget about this at this point. There was a number of missed tackles through the first three or four games. It might have been five or six missed tackles in terms of sacks or tackles for loss. But he was there. I think he was rounding into shape. I really do. Because we haven't seen that issue flare up. Since that time, to my to my memory, you feel free to let me know. Then there will be in this video one instance of him getting in on the quarterback against the 49ers and Brent Urban cleaning it up. That veteran presence, presence, Clowney, Van Noy, Urban, Michael Pierce, all of those guys being there on the inside, I think is important. Or in, or at the D line, I should say, is important. It's a guy who's way better. The the reputation was he was way better against the run. This is a third and one, by the way, against Cincinnati in week two. So they do end up actually converting this. It ends up being a two-yard gain for a Mixon. Reputation was that he was better against the run. It's almost been the opposite of that with the Ravens. It's not that he hasn't been good against the run. It's just that he stood out so much against the pass. Even if he's not getting to the quarterback, hitting the quarterback, he's disrupting the pass pro often. Uh, and that's really probably what you came – if you're watching this long, that's really probably what you came here to see is him attacking the quarterback. I think Jadavion Clowney fits right in the effort. you. I feel like you can see effort in some players, um, and he's one of them. This, to me, is Jadavion Clowney in 2023. This particular play, if you can distill it down to one play, this is who he is. Now, it's going against Tennessee, his former team, so there's some added motivation there possibly. It's in London. The chaos that he brings into the pocket on pass plays. Queen and, and I think it's uh, Matabike are there as well. I feel like this play may really represent or crystallize who the Ravens are. Lightly controlled aggression. And Jadavion Clowney, I think, is a perfect representation of it. It's a great story. I hope it continues for four more games. I don't know anything about the dude at all, but I know what I see is a guy who's given everything he's got, knowing that it, it may be his last uh, his last hurrah is a guy who gets 30-plus snaps per game in the NFL. Week 16 against the 49ers, he does finish this sack off. I, I do think sometimes he plays high, like his pad level looks high to me, but he still plays through the contact. It's not like there's a couple of other players I get to watch film of that I have said, hey, they play high, and they seem to be influenced by contact easily, meaning they get knocked off their path six, eight, ten inches by a touch that I didn't, uh, by an offensive lineman's touch that I didn't think should knock them off that path because they're playing so high. Clowney looks like he's playing high at times, but still stays on his tracks, if I said that well. When I say tracks, I mean whether you're supposed to be a big gap rusher, outside gap rusher, whether you're pinching, like the first play that I showed you against Seattle. Hopefully you guys enjoy these plays being looped through. I've settled upon this being my style. Um, if there's people who think that it's better to annotate each play carefully one time through and that's it, you know, feel free to let me know. But myself personally, I feel like I notice things when I watch them uh, repeatedly. I thought there was two other situations in this game where Clowney was in on Purdy the, or on the quarterback for the 49ers, and then Brent Urban finished it off. This is one that Urban got there just a little bit late. 
against the Titans, a hit a little bit late on Tannehill. Uh, maybe the rule to me is there's still this little bit of a gray area. Clowney, if you ask me, and Matt Abike and multiple guys on this team are ones that appear to understand it because they do this consistently and don't get called for it. Against the 49ers, bottom side of the screen, this one actually gets credited to Urban, who's an extremely underrated player. If you're watching this long, first of all, you are a Ravens fan, so you know that. Uh, Urban has been very consistent this year and I think could have played more snaps. He could really fall into the category of Clowney and Van Noy, with the main difference being he doesn't have as, as many sacks. But team defense is what these guys what these guys are all about. This is about Clowney, who, unfortunately for him, allows Purdy to get out of his grasp, or Darnold, excuse me. But I'm going to highlight Van Noy up here. Van Noy is so smart. It's empty because you've motioned McCaffrey out. He's part of the rush component. He's helping out the boundary side coverage, which is Queen, Geno Stone, the safety. And I think that's Marlon up top, but I could be wrong. Kittles is jamming him up, but he's also grabbing an extra for an extra moment on Kittle to force his release to be delayed. So it ends up being a three-man rush with an add-on late in Van Noy, while Clowney has already won against the backup left tackle. Give you the same play from the end zone angle one time. So you can see there's three rushers lined up on the Ravens' left, our right-hand side of the screen. Van Noy is one of them. Kittle steps to him. And then Van Noy decides to hold for a little bit longer so, so as not to allow that delayed tight end route that we've had so much trouble with this year. Clowney winning on the top side, unable to finish. I hope he gets double-digit sacks. He hasn't had that. I think he had nine sacks two years ago in 2021 for the Browns and nine and a half sacks and nine sacks when he was 23 and 24 years old with Houston, uh, the team that drafted him. Let me know if you're as impressed with Jadavion Clowney as I am. I feel like I could do one of these videos, maybe not every week, but every other week, because him and Owe and Van Noyes do split snaps so much. And Malik Harrison plays out there some as well. Occasionally, Brent Urban does. We know against the 49ers, Travis Jones got some snaps out at five technique or, or outside, you know, D-end, outside linebacker. I'm of the opinion that we should sign him now, but I don't know what the rules are. Uh, because Clowney's a guy who wants to win a Super Bowl, in my opinion. I think he wants to be here, but maybe that's a really naive way of looking at it. If someone was to come in and double the amount of money offered for next year and they were a really good team that gave him a chance to win a Super Bowl, then of course you couldn't blame him if he took that offer. I hope that Eric DaCosta and, and, and the Ravens front office are able to give him a competitive salary offer next year because I think he brings a lot to the table that you see on the field, but also behind the scenes. He seems like a guy who's totally bought in, and um, I seems like a guy who has a lot higher character than he was portrayed to have earlier in his career. The final element to add or to try to cover here with Clowney is his awareness. On top of all the other things, the commitment level, the tenacity, the skills, and athletic ability to get to the quarterback, probably a little bit of... Um, disregard for offensive players' well-being because he plays super aggressive is the awareness and understanding when to get his hands up when he's not going to, quote, win and get to the quarterback first and knock passes down. I don't even know how many passes deflected he has this year, but I'm going to show you three of them. I feel like Van Noy is known for this, but Clowney is a guy who provides that versatility. Uh, is maybe just not as, no as well known for it. This is second quarter against the Chargers on the road. Completion to Keenan Allen, their best player, or second best player if you think Justin Herbert is their best player. And I don't know who causes this. I think it's Clowney, but maybe it's Roquan. In any case, it, it's charged to Roquan, I believe, as the guy who forced a fumble. I think Clowney has punched in here with his right arm. The larger point for me here is, though, dropping him out in the first place. Often teams will drop their outside linebacker to the boundary, the shorter side of the field, even though the NFL hashes are, are very tight together as compared to college and certainly high school, you still have a tendency to drop the OLB uh, to the boundary. In this case, the Ravens are dropping Clowney from the field and adding a rusher 
from the boundary. In this case, it's the boundary side inside linebacker, Patrick Queen. As an aside, this is very similar to what they did to the Miami Dolphins this past week when Roquan intercepted a slant from the other side. Essentially the same thing. The only difference here is Roquan sees that Justin Herbert is looking directly at Keenan Allen. Him and Clowney essentially arrive at the same time, force the fumble that, oh, by the way, was recovered by Brent Urban. End zone angle, same play. This is just the final illustration or the final nail for me to show how versatile and how complete uh, Jadavion Clowney is. He's still only 30 years old. You may have a different opinion than me. You may think, hey, man, it, at some point he's going to lose his effectiveness, age, uh, wear and tear, loss of athleticism. It doesn't look like that's the case right now to me. We did the same thing last year with Justin Houston and JPP and utilized those guys, those two guys to great effect and were able to recoup basically more production out of less money allotted, I believe, to Clowney and Van Noy. I don't want to see us go through the same process again next year. If Ojabo's not able to go, if Oway's not a guy that's going to play 55, 60 snaps a game, to me it makes perfect sense to go to Jadavion Clowney the day that we can and try to lock him up. And if that means two years on an extended deal for low money, then so be it. It's far easier to make the case for for a versatile, very smart, very aware football player when you're talking about Kyle Van Noy because that's his reputation. That's what he was in his first iteration uh, with the New England Patriots and in all the places that he's moved on to. Clowney's reputation, it was, he was a great player in college already, but that huge hit in the a New Year's Day bowl game illustrated his athleticism so so brightly that that was what he was known he was known for pure athlete you see he's more versatile than that and if you're a ravens fan which you are if you're watching this long you've realized that already van noy you nobody has to sell you how versatile he is what surprised me with him is the pass rush strength and power at times he seems to have not just a great understanding of run plays, pass plays, how do I react, versatility in moving in different places. He seems to have an understanding of when to go to the bull rush, when to go to an outside move, and when to go to the spin move. Um, I'm kind of surprised by his athleticism, and that sounds like a slight. I certainly don't mean it that way at all. This is a third and seven important play in the third quarter against the Rams, a game that we had to go to overtime to win. And in this case, Van Noy's play to the boundary on a running back screen to Kyron Williams ends up forcing a huge loss. I think it's a loss of seven or eight on the play. Puts the Rams out of field goal range and forces a punt. Momentum swing there really doesn't need any explanation. Denying them the opportunity to get more, three more points in a game that was tied at 31 at the end of regulation. End zone angle, same play. Won't necessarily see it clearly. He's off to the right-hand side of our screen, three o'clock position, by the way. Just super smart. There's really nothing you can show him that he hasn't seen before. The Patriots used to were one of the few teams, and they, this comes from the Giants and, and Belichick and Parcells in the 80s and 90s, not letting uh, running backs cross their face. It actually really reminds me of what they did to Marshall Falk and the Rams. The first time that the Patriots beat the Rams in the Super Bowl was basically chip him, go with him, cause more congestion trying to throw to the running back because Kurt Warner and the Rams – through to Marshall Falk so much. That rule is one that I think is instilled and ingrained in Kyle Van Noy. He seems to do that quicker and and more instinctively than um, anybody else that plays outside linebacker for us. Having said all that, when you ask him to play head up or in a tight nine technique against a tight end, uh, you've got an ass kicker outside linebacker there who will win those physical battles against most tight ends. Now, this ends up being a four-yard gain. But uh, I find it laughable. I got three comments when I did this video after the Rams game. I was like, hey, man, that's a loss. Like, are you kidding me? He's dominating the tight end. So much so that the tight end is pissed off about it and tries to hit him in the back and ends up hitting his own player, his own teammate, because Van Noy dominated him so swiftly. If Van Noy doesn't win that battle, who the hell does stop this run play from being more than a four-yard gain? Um I'm not sure what I can do for people who don't understand that when a nine technique outside linebacker takes a tight end and resets his feet back almost two yards in the backfield, there's the uh, line of scrimmage and there's the left foot of that tight end, that that's an absolute win to be able to fold inside the C gap 
That's not his gap because he's lined up in a nine technique, but I digress. Against the run, last um, play to illustrate it, stands up the tight end here and forces Derrick Henry to bring it back downhill inside, not giving him a two-way go, basically. You talk about resetting the line of scrimmage. I think the line of scrimmage is the 16, maybe the 16 and a half, and he's got that tight end's feet. I mean, it almost looks like it's back at the 19, but let's call it the 18. This is a dominating play from Kyle Van Noy from a strength standpoint into the boundary. Matabike's there. Humphrey folds in. I think this is the play where the Ravens are taking Humphrey and then jumping him outside on the snap. So if Henry tries to bounce it, they've got a bonus player out there. And then Queen's supposed to fill inside. Matabike is uh, playing backdoor technique. Ends up winning as well. I am maybe, Perhaps I'm more impressed with Van Noy as a run defender than you are. Uh, if this one doesn't impress you from Van Noy, I'm not sure how we can talk football here. So late in the game against the Titans, Van Noy and Clowney uh, put on a show. Malik Willis gets in, different style quarterback maybe than Ryan Tannehill. Some of the calls were different, the play calls. Remember they hit us with a big screen. This is a sick, sick spin move by Van Noy. And... Uh, understanding I've got to get to him now instead of taking another step. Uh, he's diving in to finish the quarterback off. I don't think there's an – this is Nicholas Petit for Ferreira, I think is how you say it. Maybe Van Noy's just falling, but it's a beautiful play. He actually does uh, get credit for this sack. The fact that he's got eight sacks this year, I will say that it surprises me, but if you were to look at the – if you were to go back and look at the 2022 film, the last five games of the season, this is what it looked like. Would I have predicted that he would have eight sacks? No, I wouldn't. Clowney and Van Noy are both involved here, clearly. I would not have predicted that he would approach double-digit sacks. If Kyle Van Noy or anybody that uh, knows him or cares about him listens to this video, would I have predicted that he would play a lot of snaps for us and play well? Yes, and in fact, I did in a training camp video advocating that we should sign him right now when we found out that... Um, Owe had suffered an injury. I believe that's right around the time that I put it out. I'll try to link it up in the description so you can see it. Another sack for Van Noy in the last two weeks. This one uh, against the right tackle. Uh, first and 10. Purdy is still in the game. I think, it's, I think it's third quarter. I might be wrong. Look at the power that this guy has when he decides to go downhill on someone. Whatever he set up prior to this one looks like almost like speed to power. Up the field, gets the guy to open up perpendicular to the line of scrimmage, like a 90-degree angle. And once his shoulders are turned like that, Van Noy gets up under and brings him basically back into Purdy's lap. That's a sick pass rush move. The same guy that dropped a spin move on a second-year tackle, <clears throat> Nicholas Petit Ferreira, I believe is an Ohio State guy. At this point, I've looked at so much draft film in the last two years, I kind of can't remember which – um which school certain guys went to. First game he played with us had an impact. Here he is winning on a speed rush, uh, doesn't get to the quarterback, forces Thompson Robinson out of the pocket, ends up being an incompletion. Great play by Daryl Worley up at the top. But just an illustration of the moves that you've got. The spin, spin move against the Titans left tackle, the speed to power bull rush slash bull rush against the 49ers right tackle. And then here you are, first game he played for us, week four on the road, against the Browns, winning with a speed rush up top against their right tackle, who was healthy at that time. Last two plays will show you, I think just illustrates his versatility. I haven't even shown you him really dropping out in pass coverage. I don't think I need to. Uh, you know at this point how damn good he is at it. There's something about me, I guess maybe it's because I'm older. I really appreciate the old athletes who can figure out how to do something one more time or hopefully two more times because hopefully we bring these guys back and they can give us somewhat similar production next year. But uh, what would be ideal is Odafe Owe switching roles with these guys in terms of sack output. Absolutely true. And then Ojabo giving us something along the same lines as one of these guys. To have the most depth possible at the cheapest amount of price, I think, is what we want. Ojabo's still on a rookie deal. Owe, I believe, next year will be on the fourth year of his rookie deal. These are two veterans who hopefully we uh, finish a wonderful season with and they have the desire to come back, but 
could see one or both of them being offered more money because the film is fantastic. This is one of the better plays I've seen this year. Third and one on the road in the third quarter against the Chargers. Justin Herbert has a wide open tight end out in the right flats. We've busted some kind of coverage here. This is the type of play that Van Noy makes, if you ask me, in a big game to cause a turnover or get a get a key defensive stop. And I don't know how many guys we have like this on this defense, even though this defense is amazing. Kyle Hamilton's one of them. Marlon Humphrey, I think, is one of those guys. Marcus Williams, I know, only has one interception this year, but he's always been a ball hawk. Geno Stone has, I think, seven interceptions now this season. Patrick Queen, at this point, is playing great coverage into the boundary. How many of those guys have playoff film of them making big plays against the run, the pass, out in pass drop, out in the flats, like Van Noy, Van Noy does, like that play that I just showed you? None. None of them. Van Noy has that pedigree that I think is important. He's a guy who's always made big plays in big moments, and I think he's going to do that in this playoff run. Perhaps I think too highly of these two guys. I just think that I see film that looks like it's at the highest level edge defender that we've had in a while. We all would have loved to have kept Matt Judon, clearly. The close or on-again, off-again signing of Zadarius Smith, we were all excited about because of the the size, the speed, and the athleticism and experience that he brings. I'm not too sure that we don't have, at least for 2023, I'm not too sure that we don't have two better football players than both of those guys right now. And I know there'll be people that disagree with that, but the film, what's out there for us this year, has been exquisite. These guys have a knack for making big plays and understanding things that I think some young players just do not recognize as quickly. And I'm not, that's not a knock on Odafe Owe or David Ojabo. It's just the old experienced guy who's, seen, who's been there, done that, and seen everything. And these guys are in it to win it. I'm a big fan of, of Kyle Van Noy. I wasn't as big a fan of Jadavion Clowney before this year, but the film and the tenacity and the aggression – I think as a parent, hopefully I did a good job of presenting you guys with film such that uh, considerate evidence that we should re-sign these guys as soon as we're able to. Appreciate you guys' time, man. If you think other Ravens fans would enjoy this film study, look at Jadavion Clowney and Kyle Van Noy uh, packaged as a video once again, then please consider grabbing a link to this video, sharing it out on social media so other Ravens fans can enjoy it as well.